Greetings students and welcome back to another lecture on complex variables. In this video I'm going to show you how to use the residue theorem to evaluate improper integrals. So let's start by reviewing basic calculus and let's look at how improper integrals are usually evaluated using calculus techniques. Recall that if I had an improper integral of f of x over a semi-infinite interval, so from 0 to infinity, I could evaluate it by replacing the infinite upper bound by some parameter r and then taking the limit as r approaches infinity. When this limit exists, we can say that the improper integral converges, and if this limit doesn't exist, then the improper integral diverges. Similarly, if I had an improper integral over an infinite interval, I could evaluate that integral by replacing the infinite bounds by two parameters r1 and r2, then splitting up the integral, and then taking the limits of each of those two split up integrals as r1 and r2 approached infinity. In this scenario, both limits have to exist for the improper integral to converge. By the way, I'm going to call this equation 1. But what if my improper integral diverged? Does that mean I should start crying, drop out of school, and ask my student loans to be forgiven? Of course not, because student loans can't be forgiven. But staying on topic, even if the improper integral diverges, we can still assign a value to it, in some cases, using something called the Cauchy principal value. The Cauchy principal value of an improper integral, from negative infinity to infinity of f of x dx, is found by replacing the infinite upper and lower bounds by some parameter r, and then taking the limit of the entire integral as capital R approaches infinity. I'm going to call this equation 2. Now in some cases the Cauchy principal value of an integral exists even when the integral diverges. Take for example the integral of x over an infinite interval. If we find the improper integral using equation 1, this first term will approach negative infinity and the second term will approach positive infinity. Since the sum of negative infinity and positive infinity is undefined, this integral would diverge. However, if we find the Cauchy principal value of the integral using equation 2, the answer comes out to 0. So the Cauchy principal value exists even though the improper integral itself diverges. And so this is how the Cauchy principal value can be used to assign numbers to integrals which would otherwise diverge. Now an interesting fact about the Cauchy principal value is that when the improper integral does exist, the Cauchy principal value equals that improper integral. We can prove this very easily starting with equation 2. If we split up this integral on the right into two parts, and then if we distribute the limit over the integrals, we end up with an expression that equals the improper integral in equation 1, as long as these two limits exist, of course. Now there's another theorem that we're going to prove here before I show you how to use the residue theorem to evaluate improper integrals. This theorem concerns even functions, and it says that if f of x is an even function and if the Cauchy principal value of the integral of f of x from negative infinity to infinity exists, then the improper integral itself converges and equals the Cauchy principal value. So for even functions, the Cauchy principal value is equal to the improper integral as long as the Cauchy principal value exists. So let's prove this theorem. Because f of x is even, its integral from negative r1 to 0 equals half the integral from negative r1 to r1 just because of the symmetry inherent in an even function. An even function is where f of x equals f of negative x. In other words, that function reflects evenly about the y-axis. Similarly, the integral from 0 to r2 equals half the integral from negative r2 to r2 because f of x is even. Now when we add these two equations, here's what we'll end up with. If we take the limit of both sides as r1 and r2 approach infinity, we'll find that the left-hand side matches the definition of the improper integral in equation 1, while the right-hand side just equals two halves of the principal value added together. And since we know that the principal value exists from the assumption of the proof, the left-hand side, or the improper integral, must also exist because the left and the right are equal to each other. And as a result, we can conclude that the improper integral indeed equals the principal value when f of x is even. Also, if we just take the second equation only in r2 and let r2 approach infinity, 
then we'll find that the improper integral over a semi-infinite interval of an even function equals half the principal value, if the principal value exists. I'm going to call this guy equation 3, and this guy equation 4. Anyway, that does it for our preamble. Now, it's time to get to the fun part. How do we compute improper integrals via the residue theorem? Well, we'll start with four assumptions that we need to make before we can actually begin the procedure. Suppose we had a function f of x that was a rational function, so the ratio of two polynomials p and q. Suppose also that p and q have real coefficients and no common factors. Then suppose that the degree of q is at least two greater than the degree of p. And finally suppose that q of z has no real zeros but at least one zero above the real axis. If all four of these conditions hold, then we can use a special technique to evaluate the improper integral of f of x over an infinite interval. The first step of this technique is to evaluate all the zeros of q of z that are above the real axis. In other words, we first need to find all the zeros that have a positive imaginary part. The second step of this technique is to set up a closed semicircular contour which we'll be integrating f of z over. I'm going to call that closed curve C. Now this semicircular region will have a radius of R, and the curve C enclosing the semicircular region can be divided into two parts. The first part, which I'll draw in white, will be a straight line from negative capital R to capital R on the real axis. The second part, which I'll call C sub R, will be a semicircular arc on the circle, which I'll draw over in blue. Now, if we apply the residue theorem, then the integral of f of z over the entire contour c is just 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of f of z at the poles which are inside the contour c. In addition, the integral of f of z over the entire contour equals the integral over the real axis plus the integral over the semicircular arc. So if we substitute that in, here's what we'll get. Now if we replace z in this first integral by the real number x, which doesn't really change anything since the first integral is over the real axis anyway, and if we then take the limit of this entire equation as capital R approaches infinity, we'll find that this first integral becomes the principal value of the integral of f of x over an infinite interval. Of course this is according to the definition of the principal value, and this is equal to the limit of 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of f of z minus the limit of the integral of f of z over the semicircular contour. The fourth step of this technique is to evaluate the semicircular contour integral. Now this step isn't as difficult as it might seem because along a semicircle of radius r, the magnitude of the complex number z, or the distance of z from the origin, is a constant equal to capital R. So what we can do is use the polar representation of complex numbers to write z as r times the exponential of i theta. This will allow us to write dz in terms of d theta and convert our semicircular integral over z into an integral over the angle theta. And now, since things are in terms of capital R more explicitly, we can easily take the limit of the theta integral as capital R approaches infinity. Usually this will turn out to be zero because of the conditions we stipulated earlier on, but it's still a good idea to make sure. And it's also good if your f of z doesn't entirely obey the conditions that we stipulated earlier on, specifically the condition where the degree of q has to be two greater than the degree of p. Once we're done with step four, and once we've found all the residues, we can then find the principal value of the improper integral using this equation that we wrote down. I've gotten rid of the limit on the residues, by the way, because the residues don't depend on capital R. Now, if f of x is an even function, then we can replace the principal value by the improper integral itself, according to the second theorem that we proved above. And this will allow us to find the improper integral of f of x over an infinite interval. By the way, if we wanted to find the improper integral over a semi-infinite interval, we would just have this whole equation. So in the end, what we're getting from our four conditions is just the principal value. But if f of x is an even function, then we can find the improper integral directly. For a function that isn't even, we would need to make sure that its improper integral converges over our infinite or semi-infinite interval. Anyway, that should cover the technique for computing improper integrals by the residue theorem.
It looks like a lot of work is involved, but let's put everything into context by doing a quick example on the side first. In this example, we want to find the improper integral of 1 over x squared plus 1. From the four conditions we wrote earlier on, we can see that f of x is a rational function, the coefficients are all real, and there's no common factor. We can also see that the degree of the denominator is 2 greater than the degree of the numerator, x squared compared to x to the power 0. And finally, we can see that the denominator has no real zeros, so we can go ahead with our technique. The first step is to find the zeros of q of z, which is pretty easy since we can factor this into z plus i and z minus i. Again, i squared is negative 1, i is the imaginary number. The zero above the real axis here is obviously just z equals i. In the second step, we set up our contour integral, which consists of an integral over the real axis plus an integral over a semicircular arc c sub r. And in the third step, we apply the residue theorem and take the limit as capital R approaches infinity to get the principal value of the improper integral. Now that we're done the third step, we can move on to the fourth step, in which we evaluate the integral over the semicircular arc as r approaches infinity. Since the magnitude of z is r over the semicircular arc, we can use the polar representation of complex numbers to write this integral in terms of theta. Now if we take the limit as capital R approaches infinity, this integrand approach is zero because there's an r squared in the denominator and only one r in the numerator. So this entire integral over the semicircular arc is zero because the definite integral of zero is just zero. So now we're left with step five. There's only one pole we're concerned with and that's at z equals i. So if we want to find the residue of one over one plus z squared at z equals i, which happens to be a simple pole here because z minus i only appears once in the denominator, what we can do is multiply by z minus i and take the limit as z approaches i. We already covered this in my how to find residues video by the way, I put the link in the description. Anyway, after doing a bunch of computation, we'll find that the residue of 1 over z squared plus 1 at z equals i is just 1 over 2i. And since this is the only residue we're concerned with, we can plug it back into the residue theorem equation and conclude that the principal value of our improper integral is 2 pi i times 1 over 2i, which is just pi. And finally, because 1 over x squared plus 1 is an even function, because of the x squared, because it's an even function, we can conclude that the improper integral converges, and it's equal to the principal value, which means that the improper integral of 1 over x squared plus 1 over an infinite interval is pi. So we've successfully evaluated an improper integral using the residue theorem. Just one thing to note before I wrap up. You could evaluate this integral using another method of trig substitution. The antiderivative of the integrand here is just tan inverse, so if you apply the limits you'll find pi as your answer, which is consistent with what we found using the residue theorem, so it's a nice verification. Anyway, that should do it for my lecture. I'd just like to finish off by thanking my patrons Jacob Soares and Jennifer Heffman for donating at the $5 level or higher to my Patreon. If you would like to become a patron, I've put a link to my Patreon account in the description and you can support me there if you want. So that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.